Hello, good evening, and welcome to another in the series, Why I Write. My name is Totlin, Totlin Oliver, and I'm your host for another presentation of our very intriguing conversational program where we get the opportunity to meet another fantastic creative mind who, you know, inspires us, another mind that inspires us, another mind that, you know, lets us realize that there is so much in this life to do. There is so much to do, so much to experience. And if we have a writing talent and if we have a story to tell, then we should get on right on with it and put pen to paper or get our fingers working really quickly on our keyboards so that we may make a note of our story and create a creative legacy. Tonight, we have a very special guest in the person of one whose father contributed gloriously to one of our corporate giants or multinational corporate giants in Jamaica, Grace Kennedy. And we will be meeting our writer, his son, who told his biography in the publication entitled Firstborn. Put your hats together and welcome for me to our stage of why I write Fred W. Kennedy. Yay. <laughs> Hello, Fred. Welcome. Turn on your mic. Turn on your mic. Your microphone. I hope I'm hearing you. Yes. So turn on mute. Oh my yes, goodness. that's all right. <laughs> Welcome, Fred. How are you? Thank doing? you. I'm wonderful. Thank you very much. And Good. it's wonderful meeting you. I had no idea of your program until you reached out on Facebook to invite me to the program. And, and I'm so grateful. And I want to say too, the the kind of work that you're doing for authors is is awesome. I don't I, I don't know other hosts that actually promote authors like this. And um, the, the couple that I've heard that you sent, the, the tapes that you sent me, it's just fantastic. So congratulations on that. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you have about 50 more episodes to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. <laughs> you know, my feet are a little bit late in putting them all up on yeah. oh, I see. easy yeah. access for everybody to watch yeah. uh, but it's coming it's coming Fred thank you so much for saying yes and thank you so much for your compliments I'm so glad to have you how are you doing how has your magical Monday been it's been great I, I've been um taking notes uh, anticipating what you might ask me I don't know you didn't <laughs> you didn't send me any questions so no, um, and that is I, I, I have made some notes. You know, the, the title of your thing, why is it? Why, why why do I write? Yeah, why it, I write? Yes. Why, yeah, it's a it's a it's an intriguing question for authors, I, I believe, because many authors don't even know why they write and or why they pick the topics they do. I know why I picked the topic of my last book, but mm -hmm. the others you really have to do a lot of soul searching. Mm -hmm. Go back and say to yourself, well, you know, what, what did I do? Uh, why did I choose that? And what was I trying to accomplish? Those things aren't self-evident, really, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So coming on the program has enabled me to do some soul searching. <laughs> you see, that's exactly why I do why I write. I do why I write. Fred, and for my audience who may not know, as we were talking off air, and as I've spoken to so many other artists, um, people in, 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 for instance, broadcasting, I had a colleague who told me, we were emceeing an, an, an event together, and he told me, he said, Totlin, I'm afraid of public speaking. I'm like, what? <laughs> and you work on radio? And I'm like, why is this? I have friends who are actors. They work on stage. You know, everybody sees them, but they're the shyest, quietest people ever. Don't they see it's the number one fear, though? Yes. You know, public and that's speaking. why I got into public speaking coaching. Yeah. Yeah. Then now for what I write, I remember the doubts I had publishing a book. I've always written, but never thought to publish. And when I thought of publishing, 
I was filled with fear and trepidation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, who am I to be writing? You know, but then when I explored my own history and my craft of writing, I was no, by no means a new writer, but just newly published. So we want to talk about your journey, not mine this evening. One day we'll have that show, but we want to talk about your journey, Fred, into the world of bookhood, <laughs> <laughs> into your world of bookery. And why okay. is you are a Jamaican currently living in Canada. Correct. So you had your origins in our wonderful little island of, you know, out of many one people, our little four, 44,000 square feet piece of rock in the middle of an ocean. <laughs> well, I, I keep thinking I'm a kind of a mongrel or a hybrid. <laughs> okay. Mongrel, um, my dad, so not Jamaicans, is a wonderful term of endearment. <laughs> My yes. dad, um, on my father's line, my dad, my, my father's Jamaican, mm. and um, his father's line can be traced back. His, my dad's grandfather, was born the year after full emancipation, eighteen thirty-nine. Mm. Uh, his name was William Kennedy, and uh, we believe that he is the son of an Irish um, overseer at an estate called Biddeford in, in the parish of Trelawney and a woman of African origin. Whether she was a slave or a freed person of color, we, we don't know. So that is my um, father's line. Mm -hmm. Three quarters, the other three quarters are Spanish. Mm. So I, I go back to the Iberian Peninsula through Dominican Republic and Cuba and so on. My mother, both my mother's parents are, 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 are from Dominican Republic and Spanish. So we grew up, that was a big influence in our family. We grew up with a, a intimate knowledge of, of Spanish. And we also, many of us, we were five of us, four of us followed that passion and actually studied and traveled extensively and studied studied language uh, Spanish. So, um, a mí me gusta, me me gusta. Oh, tu habla español. <laughs> <laughs> so that 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 is um that 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 is sort of the, the that that heritage. Um, I was thinking back. I was saying about soul searching. I was thinking back on certain milestones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in my in my childhood, the kinds of things that may have influenced me. It's it's hard to know though. And did you did you grow up in cause and effect? Did you grow up like in Trelawney or in St. Andrew? No, I grew up in Kingston, mm -hmm. and the biggest one of the biggest things in in that changed the course of my life was to go to St. George's College. Mm. I'm a Georgian, true and true, true blue blue blood, blue they blood. <laughs> but um, I tell you the circumstances around that. My dad had this idea that boarding school was good for children, that it was better to raise children were better off in boarding school than at home. So my three older siblings, my brother went to Georgetown Prep in Washington, and my two older sisters went to you might you might know it is called a Servite convent in Brownstone. Anyway, mm -hmm. a group of nuns from England who had established a, a boarding school there in St. Anne. So my time came. I was pulled out of school and tutored in French and Latin and told that I was going to a Jesuit boarding school in England, in London, England. Wow. Well, thank God. I don't know whether it's a guardian angel or what, but it didn't happen. And um, the, I think it was a combination of things. My older sibling said, no way. Their experiences at boarding school have been so terrible. Mm. They said, no way. You, you cannot send him away. I was only 10 years old. You cannot send him away. Um, it, it'd be terrible for him. And then along with that came the threat of the Bay of Pigs invasion. And they thought that a third world war was going to, mm. going to happen. So they didn't want me far from home. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, you have a choice. You can go to Campion College or St. George's College. Campion College opened that year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. 
in those days it was maybe not as much now, but it was quite elitist in those at, at, in, in the in the 1960s. Anyway, I chose to go to St. George's College for a number of reasons, I guess because my dad had been there and my brother and so on. So, um, but that I think that it's funny how things happen in life. Um, and um, it, it came full circle. I can talk about that later, but I, I returned after, at the end of my teaching and administrative career in, in Canada, I was offered a job to be principal of St. George's College Wow! in 2005. So it's like that was sort of the height of my career because it was felt like everything had come full circle. Circle, wow. And um, I don't know how to put this, but St. George's is almost like a microcosm of Jamaican society. It, For us who grew up, we grew up very much protected with family and so on, but going to George's and, and being allowed to, to take the bus and stay after school and um, you know, make friends and, and so on, it, it, it made a huge difference in, in, in my life. What and, would you say are the three top differences that experience made in your life right there? Well, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. It, it just I looking back, it really made me um, fully um, understand and immerse myself in in, in Jamaican culture, in language, mm. people, everything. Otherwise, I would have been I don't know a little British boy in in London, Ontario, in London, England. I mean, it, the the whole thing would have been. My life would have been completely different. Difference, I got you. So instead but, of being a, a, a true Jamaican, completely exposed to an amalgamation of cultures in exactly. one educational place. Exactly. You know yourself not linear where you're just more Eurocentric than Caribbean centric, which well, is a combination of everything. You found that St. George has provided that kind of haven respite oasis for you is exactly. what i'm hearing exactly and and you know how boys are they, they will <laughs> do things that are <laughs> <laughs> the jamaican boys the jamaican they would, would sneak out sneak out at lunchtime and anyway i won't go into all of that but <laughs> you're not going to tell any tears <laughs> of that nature right? i have i have daughters and grandchildren and so on they will listen to this <laughs> But um, but we had excellent teachers, and that was another thing I was reflecting on, you know. And I I did well I did well in English. Um, we had some excellent um, um teachers. Uh, teachers don't realize the kind of influence they have on you. Like if you do extremely well, for example, you know, in, in a, you write a, an essay. I remember bringing home an essay once. It was a hundred percent on the. I didn't do well in all subjects. Because mm -hmm. I was very young. I was only 10 years old when I started at George's. And mm -hmm. it took a long while to catch up. But by the senior years, um, I was I was doing much better. And then I don't know if you know the name Richard Holong. Um of course. But yes, he he was very influential. He was a Jesuit scholastic at the time, but he was our sixth form English teacher. And um, he had this idea that the British and the English cur curriculum was very restrictive. Mm -hmm. So he built a whole library of American fiction for us. And our idea was to read and discuss these books. It, it had a tremendous um, influence on, on, on me. Um, so um, things I had looked at, um, thinking back on some of those writers like Salinger and John Steinbeck and mm -hmm. Harper to Kill a Mockingbird, all of those were new to us because even then in the 60s and 70s, the, the, the curriculum was very, you know, oriented to, to, to English. British, Eurocentric, yeah, right. It was Eurocentric. So even it wasn't Caribbean, it wasn't until I went to University of the West Indies, that's another story. That radicalized my thinking even more. I studied literature, and that was that was really like a renaissance, I believe. Of, of, that was in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that, to me, looking back, that was a renaissance of Caribbean literature and history. I mean, wow. we we had, I, I had the, you know, look, looking back, it was extremely, uh, I was privileged to have had people like Dr. Elsa Gavaya, you know, mm -hmm. people who are, who are actually, uh, some of them have passed away, but they they they, they became prominent leaders in 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 their own in their own fields. Um, mm -hmm. Edward Brathwaite, um, Edward Ball, um, Jean McIntosh, Kenneth Ramshan, Maureen Warner. We was introduced to uh, West West African literature. Uh, right. Chima Chibi, all of those things had a um, tremendous influence, and that was the time of Michael Manley. 1972, uh, he was elected, um, and you know Michael Manley. It's a lot of a lot of that is in the book. Actually, he changed Jamaica forever. I think um, he had an influence over everything, and the, the way we the way we spoke, the way we dressed, the music we listened to, everything. He he brought a message of transformation. Mm -hmm. And um, his, that good or bad for Jamaica at that time? You think? What is your? Opinion? I was caught. Uh, I young people were caught up in it, and and it, it really I think was unnecessary because the the Rastafarian movement and the Black Power movement, all of these things under under um Sharer were were screaming um for for recognition, mm. and, and Manly really was was the one I think that 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 brought some validation to that whole Black Power movement. And a message to Jamaicans that we can no longer live in a in a in a separatist society. kind of society. Yeah, in a society. Yes, and he 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 in in one that was dependent on on colonial um, powers. Um, he he explained to us that you know the majority of um, uh, of industries, for example, were were owned by by foreigners, but. Did his experiment work? That is another question. I mean, he went so far in trying to nationalize, you know, industry and 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 companies and everything. He he ran the country broke and and he scared people and people ran away. Uh, my dad used to say, "Capital is a is a funny animal. It gets scared very very easily." Mm. And um and it did. I mean, it was a huge brain drain, wasn't there? Um, in, yes, yes. in the nineteen seventies. Mm -hmm. Um. So that that had a lot to do with um. Of course, another milestone is when I left university and um went to teach, and my first teaching job was at York Castle High School in uh, Saint Anne. Mm -hmm. And there I met my wife to be, and she was um, a Canadian girl who had come down to teach in Jamaica. And um, I don't know if she's listening to this. I, I'm not sure, but honest to God, I thought an angel had <laughs> wow come into my life. So, and and I, so in the Jamaican language, it's a boy. Rodded, I want angel. <laughs> No, so me half a meter, man. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. That means it's true. That's what I saying. know. It's true, but it's 50, 50 years later, and and you wow. know things are still good. So fantastic. Uh, we had three beautiful, boring three beautiful girls, and and they found husbands, and and we have um, um, seven lovely grandchildren too. So, That's awesome. but um, she, she was good. For me too, because I don't know if I was good for her, but she was good for me. I uh, she she really had a, a far more liberal view of 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 life and and everything. So that was a whole uh, other um, you know step towards um, self self growth and 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 change for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, that's um, amazing. How would you have described your teaching experience at York Castle? um when you just started out as a teacher because you know that is a path you chose to follow even though your father was in business your father was in corporate life you mm. know so explain a little bit about that to us you said son you're sure you want to do this let me tell you something you'll never be rich <laughs> mm. <laughs> he told me <laughs> that is what he told me but you know what 
he he was a friend uh, and uh, you you see it in the book and for all those who, who wish to purchase the book it really it is largely about his respect too for for those who were who were um who were different um you you're quite right i went i went another way i went another route mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i wasn't trained as a teacher then mm -hmm. i trained after i taught one year there um but i loved it and and when you're young like that and the students they're only a couple of years younger than you are mm -hmm. you know you come out of university you're only you know 22 and the six formers are 18 and 19 years so you know, it was a, a remarkable um, experience. I taught English, I taught history, and I taught, taught Spanish. Um, I'm sure it's against all the union rules. I mean, they gave us everything in the book to, to teach and every grade and everything. I mean, they, they couldn't do that these days, but they worked us hard. But you were young and it didn't, you know, these things didn't phase you. And it was exciting. It was our first job. And um then after that, I went and I, I took my DPED, my uh, teacher training, because I, I thought that, yes, this was something I wanted to do. And then um, I did my where practice. Did you, where did you do the teacher training? At Michael's? At UWE. At UWE. At UWE. Okay. okay. And then I did my, um, and then I did my practice teaching at, at Trenchtown Comprehensive. And that's a whole other story. I um, can imagine. Yeah. Wow. So then, uh, um, and then when I finished, I asked for a job there. So I taught for a year um, at Trenchtown, but um, that was interrupted. That, that was a bad, bad year for Jamaica, 1975, 1976. Mm -hmm. And there were some terrible incidents, um, mm -hmm. being held up and... Mm -hmm. These guys, you couldn't even go into Trenchstone uh, after after a while. We had to hold classes out at um, the Halfway Tree Parish Church and so on. So those were um, those were interest, interesting times. Very tumultuous years, man. Yeah, That's but you know what? I I felt then though that I got some recognition for the work I've been doing, and that was the first time that I was able to publicly share my work. The university loved the the um the study that I'd done with the students at Trenchstone. Um I, I ran an experiment trying to 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 show how I could raise the literacy levels of those students who were under underachieving and underperforming. Mm. So the university asked me to present the paper publicly at a at a forum in at, at the University of West Indies. So that gave me also another that was the first time I think that my work had sort of gone gone public and um how did it feel for you back then i you mean you mean you know, how, that kind of recognition how did it, it feel it, for it, it was it was fabulous and 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 then it led to other things too then i was offered a job um to work with dennis craig who was a, a linguist at the university of the west indies um in in and and pam pam mordicke who's who's a uh, you might know her She's a poet and resident in Canada. And, and she was one of our guests too. A few was she? Months ago, I was sure that was you too, yes. Fantastic, fantastic. I know her very well because I worked with her and my job was with was, was to create um, uh, curriculum stories and units for the grade 10 program in, in Jamaica. So these booklets went across to all the junior secondary schools. Uh, my name wasn't on them, but we certainly had certainly authored them, um, and the ministry published these um, um, curriculum units. And right. I was uh, guided really by um, by people like Dennis Craig, who was a real um, authority on on uh, in in linguistics. So. That that gave me a lip, and and actually, when we decided to migrate, it was that kind of background and experience that got me the jobs here in in Toronto because students were migrating, Caribbean students were migrating here, and they needed teachers who understood the learning habits and and so on of of Caribbean students. Amazing. So, what you just described to us, Fred, sounds to me like this is a perfect example 
of how truly, and especially for Jamaicans and anybody else from the, the Caribbean islands, our smaller countries, we really are citizens of the world. And our craft, our insight, our knowledge is needed in different parts of the world at any given time. And no longer um, are we to think myopic, myopically that, you know, this is where it's all at. Wherever this is, it could be somewhere in Columbia, South Carolina. It could be somewhere in Bridgetown, Barbados. It could be somewhere in, 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 in the outskirts of London, England. What you're describing to me is that when we look at our history as individuals, as we grow through different experiences, the knowledge that we gain is of such high value in at different spots of time. And it seems as if that nothing is by chance. Nothing is by happens. You know, I, I, I was thinking that when I was thinking back on, on everything, yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, My so I pursued, yeah. and, and then I was saying things went full circle because then I pursued graduate studies in Toronto. I did my master's and, and doctoral studies. Um, and then I realized too, thinking back, that, that the theme repeated itself because my the thesis of my doctoral studies was um, advanced li literacy at the basic level. I, I ran program intervention in schools with underprivileged students, students who had failed coming out of grade eight. So it was almost like a, an extension and a repeat of, of the work that I'd done at Trenchtown. So that, nice. that motif and, and theme kept going. Anyway, so I got into teaching and then administration, became a vice principal up here. And then I took a leave of absence to write my first book. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this one oh, here. That, I love it. Sam Sharp, Sammy yeah. Sharp. Yeah, Daddy Sharp. Sorry, Daddy Sharp. Again, yeah. another wonderful title since that, you know, especially since we're coming up on Father's oh, Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I love it. You know, I know, it, yeah, yeah. Daddy perfect. Sharp. So I took a leave of absence to research and, 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 and anyway, and composes. And then somebody got word that I was out and about. It was actually my good friend. Um, and I'll mention his name because I'm sure he's either watching or wanting to, to watch the tape of this, Southern Wilmot, who was a history professor at the University of West Indies. He's retired now, but he and I grew, grew up mm -hmm. like this. And I've stayed in touch for God knows. We started at St. George's College, it must, so it must be 60 years now. Anyway, somehow or the other, word got out that I was kind of like a free agent. So they offered me a job and St. George's College was looking for a principal. So um, best, 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 best years of, of my career, of my career. I, I returned so to Jamaica long. and headed up the school. Yeah. Wow. Principal Kennedy. Oh my <laughs> goodness. So How that many was years did you serve just, as principal? just two years. I, I had family obligations here. And I, I couldn't extend it anymore. Um, but there was tremendous, the school was in trouble. So they wanted um they 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 wanted a a, a change a change. And um wow, it I um they wanted skilled expertise. <laughs> it was it was crazy. I, I the, the reception. I got and the is, somebody said that you know being a high, being a principal is is uh, probably the best job in the whole world. And to me, it brought together a lot of things. You, you know the, the 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 ability to have a, a positive effect on mm. on on people and and really you run a school so that students will succeed. I mean that that is the whole purpose of of running a school. That's a big business. What were some of the um, effects you left behind after your two years there? What are you know some of your the highlights of that experience that made you go? You know, this was so worth it. <laughs> this. 
Yeah. Um, well, one, one, one big change was that we I instituted a, a, a coeducational sixth form, mm. and, and that was that was a, a huge change. Um, what year was this? Maybe this was the year. Oh, was oh, oh, six. Oh, oh, four to oh, six. Oh, 2004 to six. Okay. Yes. Wow. And anyway, we so that was a huge, uh, huge thing. And and you know what? What was the reasoning behind that, Fred? I it just it just seemed that um, the effect it had was that they actually the girls actually made a huge improvement to the academic performance of those boys. Those. Yes, because they want to them have to impress exactly. the girl. Exactly. exactly. I had never seen the first day the girls walked on the campus. I'd never seen boys with such shiny shoes in my life. <laughs> And boys carrying, carrying books, you know, under their arms, and it, you know, it was it was quite an amazing thing. That's right? a social change. That's not even yeah. educational. That's social. Social change, yes. and and um, and it it, it improved the the whole academic um, tone of the uh, tone of the school, and and academics went way up. Our 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 the ranking of the school just jumped from so I don't know what it was. I, I can't, I can't, we had a minor report. That is why they wanted a, a new principal. They had a minor report that had rated the school. I forget what it was, but it was way down on the scale. And within two years, we had jumped sky high up that scale and, and students were, um, were, were performing um, uh, the pass rates in, in English and math and everything had soared. So, um, so and, they, there must have been a lot of tears when you were packing your bag. <laughs> I don't know. It's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And, and you know, in Jamaicans, yeah, it's very, 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 very warm and, and, and good feeling there. Yeah. You know, I'm going to pause on that tear jerking moment to say hello to a few folks who are tuning in at this time. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Claudine Graham, another writer, Marilyn uh, Ballantyne from Out of St. Vincent, Alicia Harmon. Hi, Alicia, how are you doing? We have Norma Stone Walker. She mm -hmm. is the curator of Books About Jamaica on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Andrine Bonner, one of our leading writers. Mm -hmm. uh, Jaffio is watching from out of the Western part of Canada. And uh, we have uh, um, Marilyn, <laughs> Marilyn Valentine says, my goodness, Pam Mordecai again, because she watched when Pam was on. And she says, you have done great seminal work. David Carroll is also watching and um, Sandra Bonna James is watching too. Mm -hmm. uh, Claudine, our writer, says, This is beautiful. He's so humble and down to earth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lady D, Denise Gomez from out of New York is watching. Uh, uh, Maxine Plummer is also tuning in. And Burnett, another fine uh, poet from out of New York, he is tuning in too, along Wonderful. with others. What a, lot of, what a lot of connections. That's amazing. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the backstory of Daddy Sharp and how yeah. easy or difficult it was for you to get your work published and how it came to be published. Because, you know, let, let, let's talk about that. Why did you decide to do a story on Samuel Sharp, one of our national heroes in Jamaica? Right. I remember, I, I, I don't know if I was telling you before we went on li uh, live or after, but sometimes writers don't even know until afterwards why they choose what they choose, the, you know, the topics they do and so on. Um, I have a fascination when I reflect back on it. I, I have a I have a fascination for um, understanding where we came from, where we come from, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, an understanding of of, of Jamaican history. Um, and sort of the pivotal moments in 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 that that changed the course of, of of life in Jamaica, and it seemed to me of all the seven national heroes, Sam Sharp stood out as one that really was a catalyst for the abolition of of slavery. And, mm -hmm. and what greater event in our history than that than that? Um, 
it, it happened, you know, months after he was um, um, sent to the gallows. He's, he was condemned to death on um, May 23rd, 1832. Um, um, and also, so th th those are, are, are some of the reasons. Um, my interest in, in, I guess, intellectual curiosity, but, but also an understanding of Jamaica is a very complex place. And the Caribbean is a very, very complex society. Yeah. Oh my, so heavily multi-layered. Yes. Very, and I know from doing my dad's story how, how complex it is too, because he had his own internal struggles with, with, with everything. Um, so, you know, the story of Daddy Shark sh showed, uh, taught me a lot. It, it showed how society was really polarized. I mean, in, you know, in, in the 18th century, there were 300,000 slaves of African origin and, and a population of 30,000 uh, Europeans. Um, two cultures that were completely dichotomous and, and polarized. Um, out of that, out of emancipation, came obviously, um, you know, a, a, a Creole born uh, generations of Jamaicans, many of whom are of mixed race. And, and that, that is a big, big part, I think, of our of our identity. Um, I don't think those people of the second and my actually, you know, slavery is not that long ago. I mean, my grandfather was the second generation after after emancipation. When you think about it, mm -hmm. um, th those those generations uh, um, following emancipation, I. Um, I think a lot of those were the first, became the first educated Jama Creole Jamaicans. They were afforded, a, a, if their parents could afford to send mm -hmm. them to high school, they became the first doctors and entrepreneurs and so on. Um, and they emulated, ironically enough, the only standards they had for emulation were the European yes, right, ways right. of behavior and standards. So. Um, so you have a mixed race of people emulating others who, who I don't think really, honestly, I, I don't think we were ever really, uh, my dad and his father said, they, they were not, never really fully accepted into the colonial circles. Mm. Uh, I, I don't think, even though they aspired to, to the jobs and to the ways of behavior and so on, I, I don't think they ever were, um, Fully, fully uh, except I, there was a saying I didn't put in the book, but there was a particular governor of Jamaica, Governor Richards, that my dad confronted many, many times. And in a letter to my mother, I, my sister had inherited all these love letters that my parents had written during the war. Wow. Um, and letters are an amazing source for writing, by the way, personal letters, because they, they show the soul of a you know. Anyway, his comment to my mother at that time was uh, that I, I hate this man as I do poison. Wow. Uh, very strong words, but it's just that whole condescension of those who thought that they were in charge it was a huge burden on, on, on Jamaicans who were, who considered themselves the first economic nationalists, really. Though, those who were shaping a uh, a nation that was going to, well, stand yeah. independent. It, it didn't come to 1962, but anyway, where was I? I... We were talking about how you kept the Where was I? You, you asked me about Daddy Sharp. Right. And what happened in the process of producing this book? Oh, but yes. And how did I get it? It's all tangent. It's all tied together because you were explaining that, you know, how the history shaped our people today and why you decided to write the narrative um, of the life and adventures of Daddy Sharp. Yes. Right. Um, so I, 
I don't know. I, I'm obsessed with, de with, with, with historical detail. And these are historical, this is a book of historical fiction. Mm. So it doesn't mean, fiction here doesn't mean that it's not true. Mm -hmm. But fiction, if I'm near so. Fiction means here in historical fiction, it means that it's based on historical fact, but the author really has used his or her imagination to, to, to fill in those characters and those events and so on and plot pieces of the plot to make it a complete right whole, you know so and, and I think that is why um I, I I think writers of historical fiction at least I felt the way this way is that you owe it to your reader and to Jamaicans that you're not writing falsehoods that you're not making up things right you know the, and and um so even though it's not a historical te history text, it, it is a it is a, uh, a historical it is a book of historical fiction based on the life of Sam Sharp. Right. So it takes me as looking back on the books. This was published in 08. This was published in this was a second book, Wareo. This is the story of a cacique. This is a uh, the the first ancestral hero that we have. He was a Taino cacique at the time of the landing of Columbus. Mm. So this was published in 2015, that's seven years. And the most recent one, Firstborn, mm -hmm. was published 2023. Yeah, right. 2023, so seven years apart. So I, I, <laughs> I have to find a way of producing them faster, but but um, there's a lot of research goes into, went your into work. the first Your daddy is sharp, because remember now, you took sabbatical to write that book and you produced this book. What happened to your manuscript once you felt you were complete with this book? Well, I wanted a local publisher um, because I felt that really it was, it could get into the, I, hope, I had hoped it would get into the schools. It hasn't got in there yet. But I, I still, I'm still holding out um, some hope for that. Um, but it sat in a drawer um, for a long time, for about a year. And I said, you know, this is not right. I, I know what I, I've done is right. And uh, my wife actually, I, I, she's an excellent editor. And, and she's been the first editor or first reader of all the manuscripts. And when she said, you know, this thing is good and it, and it's, it, I think it could win, uh, you know, an award, it, it's fabulous and so on, the, the final product. Um, my own gut instinct said, yes, I, 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 I think I, I can publish it. So nothing happened. And um, so then I said to myself, you know, maybe I, I better get somebody to, you know, who's mm -hmm. known in the field to, to, to look at it and, and maybe if he likes it to endorse it. So I sent it to Ed, uh, Edward Brathwaite, Kamau Brathwaite, mm -hmm. who was then um, a professor of comparative studies in literature at, I'm thinking it's Fordham, but it might not have been. It was somewhere, it was a university in New York anyway. And um, I chose him because he was the ultimate authority on Sam Sharp. Government had hired him to um, research the story of Sam Sharp to see whether or not he would have qualify, you know, for being named a, a, a national hero of Jamaica. He wrote this extensive critique and just praised it to the skies. Wow. So <laughs> it was one of those feelings. So I, I, I sent it back and the publishing process started right immediately. Immediately, no more delay. No. Fifth spot, let's get this out on the road. Yeah. Daddy Sharp. Yeah. I look forward to reading that, certainly. Okay. That's Thank gonna you. be on my shelf. I know I have to retire like very soon if I wanna read all these wonderful books. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the number of books that you have to read. <laughs> and I already have a whole slate. I just bought myself a brand new book on the weekend too. On, on a totally different topic. So here you are in the world of writing. 
you didn't start writing out at the outset. As you've just described, you had an illustrious career in the education field, both in Jamaica and in Canada. And of course, you continue to follow through on your, you know, your own academic pursuits and experiences. What did you uh, write for? What did you defend as your thesis when you were doing your doctoral studies? I defended... Um... I def the, the title of the doctoral thesis was Advanced Literacy at the Basic Level. Okay, you did it on literature. Oh, yes, okay. so I was teaching in a school, a tech school. They have these, I don't think they um, stream them as, as strictly um, as they do, as they did then. But what would happen was that any students coming out of grade eight that failed subjects, especially English and math, would not be eligible to go to a regular high school. They would put them in a school okay. with technical subjects. But that, that, that whole thing tells you a lot. But anyway, um, I, I got a job there and I became head of English at that school. Um, and I, I looked at these students and I said, you know, there's got to be ways to to, to make sure that these students, they can learn. I mean, you know, there's that belief that every student can learn. Anyway, so I, I designed programs to, to raise the literacy levels of these uh, um, students. Well, called disadvantaged students, I guess, in a way, um, and, and ran the experiment over, over, over a year and uh, showing using particular markers to show that yes, in fact, um, these students are capable of, you know, advanced mm -hmm. level literacy, yeah. even though they're called, even though they're deemed to be quote unquote failures in the system. So that was my doctoral work. I and love that. I once ran a summer program where I taught um, high school non-finishers how to do um how to write english for english literature o levels and cxes and one of the first things i remember telling them in the class that day and then most of them were boys i said look nothing is wrong with your learning you just learn differently and interestingly enough i did not even pursue my masters in education at that time but i just knew i said you know what how they teach is difficult you know, the, the model of how our students learn is, is you know, directed for girls, sit down quiet kind of stuff. Absolutely. But everybody don't learn the same way. We could have a whole nother program talking about <laughs> pedagogies and andragogies and all that good stuff. Totally. But, you know, I don't know the stats, but there's something almost like 70% of students at the University of the West Indies are, are female. Mm -hmm. It's pretty high. Boys don't, there's a crisis in, in, in. Which is why I, my master's thesis that I published, we took a look, I took a look at why is it that boys in a country like Jamaica don't select higher education as a path to growth and success. I will definitely share that document with you. That'd be amazing. Because, yeah, you know, but why we are concerned, why I feel your heart about literacy is this. Through books, we learn so much. It's not just to read to pass an exam. It is to learn. It is to become aware and to learn things very quickly. You may need to read up about laws concerning something that you want to do. Absolutely. You need to be able to read quickly and understand medications or prescriptions given. You need to learn to read to understand. It's not just okay to be watching something online. You need to be able to be re really literate. When people use the word literate, we don't talk about just reading. We are reading with understanding, reading and growing your vocabulary. Oh my goodness, don't get me started. Let's go to your next but you know, Just on the side, Totlin, that's the success story of Daddy Sharp. Mm. I, don't, who he, I, used, I made a mistake once in an interview with Vereen Shepherd, and I said, benevolent master. And she shut me down and said, no master can be benevolent. And I said, you know something? You're right. But what I meant to say 
was that Daddy Sharp had a had a, a master, Mr. Sharp, who was not cruel to him in the traditional sense. He was not beaten and chained and so on, but he was allowed certain privileges. And one of them was that he be taught to read and write. Right. Mm. And it was that exposure that allowed him to understand the Bible and also to understand all the abolitionist literature that was coming out of England at the time. And he gave, literacy gave him power. Exactly. And that's what we see and we want to pass on. Thank you. I love that. Literacy gave Daddy Sharp power. It did. Amazing. It did. Without it, he could never have done what he did. He yeah. could never have understood that there were people in England who were wanting for the abolition of slavery and he would never have become a daddy a daddy in the baptist sense was a a, a minister of religion and when bircher left the island he would take his place sometimes as as the as the preacher in in the baptist church in in, in montego bay so he befriended the baptist ministers who as you know had a who were very instrumental in hmm. um, in, yes. in, in the fight for emancipation yeah so let's go to your next book that you published seven years later <laughs> and how that came about you know your and yeah. I, I, I love this oh my goodness i am looking for a story of a jamaican cacique see we never we weren't taught a lot exactly. about our cacique heritage in our island exactly so i was looking for you know heroism is a is a kind of a, a motif of the books in a way and somebody said to me, he said, not only heroism, but people who are freedom fighters and rebels too. And I said, well, maybe, maybe deep down in me, there's a rebel somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I write about people who have heroic qualities that 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 somehow um, use their 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 talents to 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 liberate others and also to fight against you know wrongdoing and that was the same with Wario. um this again is a historical figure um and i it was looking for who in our past was um really not celebrated but but perhaps had a um you know in an effect on the change of uh, you know circumstances and life in Jamaica. And um, I went back to Nanny, but I couldn't find enough on her. But mm. she's, a she's a character, she's a character in my next book. Mm. I, I got, I'll tell you about that later, but Nanny is a character. But anyway, this goes back really to the, to, to the time of the uh, average, uh, of the original indigenous people. Mm. I found information in this, um, Columbus um, was marooned in Jamaica in 1503. And he had his son with him, Hernando Colon, and also um, a, his lieutenant, um, I think his name was Diego Mendes. And they wrote journals about what they saw and, and did. Uh, in, in Jamaica during that period, I think it was almost a year, they were marooned here. Their ships were eaten out with, and, and they couldn't sail and they were stranded. Um, so out of those writings came a story of Wareo, who they said was, uh, was one of the chief caciques in um, what is now present day Port Maria mm. in Jamaica. So it's a story around what happens to his people with, of course, the colonization by the Spanish. And as you know, the stories are, are brutal and, and horrendous. Um, it's harder to, I always like to, to leave hope in, uh, at the end. You know, they say every tragedy should have you know, even Shakespeare and tragedies end, end with a sense of mm -hmm. 
hope, you know, like Daddy Sharp, this emancipation. I mean, that's a huge to to lift the, the lift the spirits of, of 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 your reader. You want to entertain your reader, but you want to give them a, a feeling of upliftment as well. Right. It was harder with Wario because wow, you know, smallpox and everything just it, it um decimated the populations of the indigenous people of the Caribbean. Just eradicated them just like that. Oh my God. But what came out of it though is, is a realization and there is a big movement now to understand that really um, there's a lot to be celebrated in the islands. Not as much in Jamaica, but I understand now that we, we do have a, um, a, a, a local um, um, Jamaican a cacique, um, but in Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and Cuba especially, there is so much there that um, is to be um, celebrated. Um, and ce yes, exactly. So the, the Taino people do not consider themselves um, extinct in any way. And then after writing the book, Tatlin, guess what? My wife is a genealogist. And she discovers that my mother is a descendant of a uh, uh, cacica from Cuba. Wow. So some indigenous blood runs in my veins <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and here you are today. No wonder you can interpret the, the energy and the vibrations from the DNA in your system. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. There must be something there. And I, I, but you know what, with these books, because they're historical fiction, you want them to be authentic. Yes. So I, I, I had readers, you know, prominent leaders in the, in, in the Taino community in Puerto Rico and New York and everything go through the manuscript and uh, wow. yeah, you, ha ha you have to, um, you need, that's another thing, you know, with writers, you need you need mentor you need a at least I do you you need mentors you need people to to guide you you have the you you believe in yourself and you have the talent and you can you know put it together but um you need guidance right right we all right. do I mean, um and and they were they were uh, tremendous um so I had just like um Brathwaite had endorsed. Daddy Sharp. Um, so too, I, I, I received it. But it was easier to publishing this because mm -hmm. you had already proven yourself with one book. So right. the publisher didn't argue. They just went to town. So the same publisher published this book. You just you just handed in and there was no questions asked. And, yeah. and how did you know that that pronunciation of the name of the cacique chief was the way it was? And it's spelled the way it was because I'm looking at it and I'm seeing you are real. <laughs> and I'm so glad I'm talking no, to war, you. War, 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 it's like, so, um, it's you know, like, it's, a, it's a weird thing that the Spanish found that the Taino language had this very similar phonetics to their own. It, it was amazing. And they found it easy to learn Taino. So, I don't know if I've done the right thing. I was told by one person that perhaps they, I should have used alternate spellings, but I, I do qualify. At, the, I, 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 at, at one point in the book, um, I say that a, a note on orthography, I've used the standard spelling rules of Spanish mm -hmm. to approximate the sounds of Taino words. The variations may cause confusion to the speaker of English. There we go. Uh, the silent H in Spanish. <laughs> so that's the silent H in Spanish. I or, love it. I absolutely love it. So, so, um, so love but it. the Spanish found it easy to, uh -huh. to, to speak it because the phonetics were, were you know, any, any of the words that you pick out uh, of Taino language. It can be pronounced with a Spanish um, orthography, like language. Um, mm. Any of them. Wow. Even um, you know, Yeah, just, I got it. So now, I, I, with my knowledge of Spanish, 
I then translated the book into Spanish. Okay. Uh, this, yeah, this is called um, Where you Cacique de Jamaica. Mm. I dedicated this book to my mom, mm -hmm. um, Lidia Matilde Lorena Sarceno, who's a, um, you know, born in Dominican Republic. So she would have loved to have read this in, in Spanish. So, mm -hmm. so I, I published it in but Spanish. Fred, you published it in Spanish. Listen, but Fred, it sounds like you need to write your own biography. But no, no, no. don't go to tell me about no, no. Don't tell me about any no, no. But let me read this bit. A. Rafael Diaz, the former CEO and chairman of Grace Kennedy mm -hmm. Limited, mm -hmm. wrote, Firstborn is a riveting account of the life of Luis Fred Kennedy, whom I admired as an outstanding leader and champion of the private sector. Written by his son, it is a monumental work of a true Jamaican patriot and humanitarian. This is what A. Rafael Diaz, the former CEO and chairman of Grace Kennedy, big company in Jamaica said, Firstborn is the life of Luis Fred Kennedy, 1908 to 1982. And um, this is an inspiring, true story, different from what you've written before, of family, business, and enduring love. Told by his son, Fred Jr. <laughs> Talk to me now about this. <laughs> Why you choose to read your told, parents' you know, big this, people letters? Fred, you went and you read your parents' private big people letters. Yes, I did. And I, I had to, I told Mary, my sister, I said, you know, I feel funny doing this because growing up, these letters were secluded in a cupboard, locked in under lock and key, and in a very pretty looking box with a big ribbon around it. I so said, you'd never touch these until. So it's, it's not now that they now that they passed away. I felt I I, I had to make a decision as to whether to use them or not. Mm -hmm. But my they had been passed to my sister, so she, together we said yes. And but I used them with discretion. Of course. I, I wouldn't put things in there that they that I think they wouldn't have wanted the general Fun public to know. Public to know, because there were some there were love letters, and he she was in New York and he was in Jamaica, and there were no planes going back and forth in those days. So the letters took about two or three weeks on by boat to reach New York, and um, anyway, they 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 what were they ama me? amazing. Um, he was a uh, Quite a romantic, as it turns out, mm -hmm. almost like a lovesick Romeo. I wonder if I can find. I don't want, I have it marked. <laughs> Please find it and read it for us. <laughs> and guys, remember you can get all of Fred's books on his website. Mm. His website fredwkennedy.com, and there's a beautiful trailer of the firstborn, and he has won an award for this. From his peers, my goodness! Congratulations! Thank you very friend. much. That oh, was totally goodness. out, totally out of the out of the. It's been wonderful, and you probably you picked it up because of the award. Maybe I don't know. No, I didn't. Why I would have come? How would I? I would have come to your attention. I don't know. But I would have because you see, once you're an author, you're a writer. Oh, I I'm, see. I'm I'm looking I'm looking for people like you, because again. I know many of our authors are, are, are not fantastic in self-promotion. You're depending on your publisher who they have like 100, 300, 800 other authors to publish. And uh, it could be a curry favor business if as an author, you don't get the opportunity to talk from your heart what your work is about. And how, how else would we want to read your book? We need to meet you, the writer, and hear you tell it from your perspective so that, you know, our interests go all the way up there, you know? So while you look for that right page, um, yes, uh, Marilyn, thank you so much for um, joining us and saying that, yeah, the shepherd will not kill. 
keep quiet. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dean Peart is watching, hi, welcome. Uh, Eric Douglas, thank you so much for watching, Eric. Um, you're enjoying this. Uh, Fred, Eric Douglas wants to know if you had a brother who worked in TV for a short while, television for a short while. No, I had okay. friend Francis, his name was Paco, but he worked for Grace Kennedy. Okay. Yeah, my eldest brother, yeah, but he's passed now. Mm -hmm. um, I just, one, one line here, it sounds like Shakespeare. He wrote to her, he says, my darling, these infernal days have suddenly appeared to have as many hours as they used to have minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and he drowned his sorrows in work and late night poker games with one consolation only that his boss had taken leave. She took a long time to say yes, because she was engaged to somebody else what empty for my not, girl not <laughs> <laughs> story comes not engaged but she he he was going to ask her to marry mm -hmm. but she said that he was too slow and he didn't ask in time or something but she let him go um he, he was a doctor um from puerto rico um, wow that's an intriguing uh, love story. So tell mm. us the start, um, why you decided to write your dad's biography and, and you know how it just brought you to these secret letters, these romantic letters, and you get a nice story um, to offer in the way of this biography. Tell us this, tell us why, why, why this, especially mm. after two fictional uh, dramatic pieces that you wrote. Yeah, well, uh, this one I knew, I didn't know why I was specifically writing those others. Those had more sort of um, general ideas of, of, you know, quest or on trying to understand our past and things like that. But this one had a specific purpose. The, the, I wanted to um, uh, write this biography to, to celebrate in time for a celebration of the centenary of Grace Kennedy. Um, and it, it was published in November, uh, of, officially published in November of, of last year. And Grace Kennedy celebrated 100 years in 2022. Mm. So that was a specific thing. I told my friend, uh, so then I said, you know, I, I have to do, I have to write something. Maybe I should write a link to the Gleaner. I have to write something about that. Otherwise, you know, I mean, he contributed so much to this company and also to Jamaica. Um, you know, now that they're celebrating Grace Kennedy's 100th year, I, I have to put something out. So um, can I read a bit about why it was written? Please. From the forward. It said, this biography tells a story of my father, Louis Fred Kennedy. The motivation came from a conviction of the importance to memorialize his life to share his history and legacy. He contributed significantly to Jamaica's national development and in this pursuit demonstrated the character of a man who became a staunch nationalist and fierce advocate of private enterprise. Once I decided to undertake the project, a day did not pass without recalling vignettes of my dad's life. Everything started to jog my memory, places that we'd been together, shared hobbies of gardening and boating, vacations and trips to New York and Montreal, casual daily conversations on the veranda at home, and the more serious business-like and philosophical discourses that he relished so much. Mm. That's, those are the opening lines of the forward. This gives you sort of like a taste of why, 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 why I would have taken on the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to pen that? And this must have been so personal, close and intimate for you. Yeah. It must have provided you with some never before thought of thoughts and understandings. That's How true. long did it take you to write the manuscript for this one? I started in um, 2018. Mm -hmm. I, it was rushed. You know, uh, normally um, it would take me longer. It would take me about five years 
takes about five years for me to five years to research and then about two years to publish. This took about um, three years to write and one year to publish. Um, I went with Friesen Press. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was a Canadian publisher. And um, because the publisher in Jamaica didn't think that they could, um, that it was going to be too big and, and, and they weren't sure that they could mar market it and get their, you know, returns on it. So whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so I, 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 um, I, I went elsewhere, but you know, it goes back to, 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 to something I was going to say earlier that even with this book, um, you put it out to editors, Friesen Press had certain editors and, and editors tell you things that, 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 you know, in your gut are, are, are not right. So, yeah. you know, you see, like, like they said, why are you putting, because I have in here, I have sections in in anecdotes in in italics mm -hmm. sections in italics like this one the first one June it's all in italics June nineteen seventy six seventy six troubled oh. times it's a conversation between me and my dad it's recreated um and I have these going throughout the book. These are recollections of conversations and things that we had had together. Mm -hmm. No, the editor said, no, they have to come out. They don't belong. <laughs> well, then, you know, I had to go with your gut. He said, uh, and you know, it's, it's those very things that uh, have appealed to, to, to readers is the human story. And that is, they say that that is what, good writing is it's it's yes. the, it's the human story that counts mm -hmm. so <laughs> so in this book you tell this whole story of your dad's life his beginnings his wars within self his accomplishments his achievements his regret all the yes. way through to the end of his life what yes. position did he have at grace kennedy during his lifetime well it's called firstborn because he was the firstborn of six children. Mm. His father founded the company in 1922. His father died just after my dad came back from college. My dad was a, he was like a genius. He graduated from university, um, Holy Cross College at age 19. Mm. Came back um, in 1928, um, two years later, he had a traumatic experience with his father um, actually dying. Um, my dad used to read late at night. Um, and um, his father wasn't feeling well and, and walked through his room to the bathroom that was adjacent to his room, uh, came back out and fell on, on him. Collapsed. Collapsed and, and died. That that haunted him for the rest of his life. But anyway, he was thrust then as firstborn. He was older than his others. Um, thrust into this responsibility of being the breadwinner for his family and being a co-manager. He co-managed the company along with a man called James Solomon. Co-managed the company until Dr. Grace, who was the other founder, retired in 1947. He was an old man by then. And then um, my dad then um, became, then became governing director and chairman of the board for, until he retired and gave over the chairmanship to Carlton Alexander in 1976. So for those 29 years, he really steered the company through, you know, thick and thin, you know, and grew the company. I mean, the company grew from, it started as a small little company, 15,000, 
you know, 15, um, a revenue of about 15,000 pounds and about 12 or 15 employees. When he retired, there were 2,000 employees and profits of, you know, revenues of $85 million and, and it, it had expanded. And he was a visionary. He, he understood that Jamaica, as small as it was, should look outside. He, he formed subsidiaries in, in, in Montreal, in Rotterdam, in the United Kingdom. He pushed for the 1960s, brought the Grace brand. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, they were really distributors of raw materials that had no branding name or anything. So um, 1960, I think it was um, Vienna Sausages became the first Grace canned mm -hmm. product. And that was marketed um, in 1960. And then with advent of television and supermarkets and everything, the whole every oh, the whole marketing changed. Changed, right. And he was they were able Grace became a household name, really. And Very still much so. in the diaspora, it still is. And it's still is, yes. I go different places and everywhere I turn, I yeah. have Grace products right now in my kitchen cupboard. <laughs> you know, if, if I'm not mistaken, I'm there you go so it, it's it's a remarkable story and um he was a complex man though you know and he had different personas and mm -hmm. i you know discovered that i mean um you know as a businessman he was a uh, he was different from me i mean he, he was a type a personality and uh, and um and quite aggressive and and exacting and demanding and but at home he was a different person he was that way with my older sibling i was at the bottom of the family along with my younger sister so by then he had kind of sobered uh, <laughs> <laughs> which happens a lot in families i think oh yes by the time the because you're number what in your family line number um four Number four. So my two older sisters and my eldest brother. My eldest brother really was it was very difficult for him because mm -hmm. he entered the business at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um I don't know if I should tell this story, but it 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 um it's in the book, so I might as well um sure you can share. Yes, I can share. Um my brother um came back home uh, from university early. He was only 19, I think. He wanted to work and, and he wanted to return to Jamaica. He was at Holy Cross College. And he, his first day of work at school, at, at Grace Kennedy, he was all very proud and waiting to get up and go and everything. And um, he was living at home at the time, of course. And anyway, he went down and he thought he'd wait for my dad and sat in the you know, in the, in the driver's seat. And my, my dad comes and says, what, what, what are you doing here? Says, I'm looking for a ride, to, a ride to work. You don't you don't ride to work with the boss. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so from then on, from then on, he had to take the, the 14 Jolly Joseph bus was around yeah. the corner from in the house and that's actually a lesson in um what you may call it tenacity a lesson in you know learn the ropes <laughs> sounds like an intriguing book though. i know i know but anyway he, so he he took the bus to to work and um anyway there, many people tell the story actually um very good friend of ours um anna figaro she's anna jarvis she's um I don't know if I can find it, but there's, there's a number of people tell the story. And um, <laughs> Adrian Bonner wants to know if you're still in touch with Mabel 10. Yes, I am. And I, I and I interviewed her for, 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 for the book as well. Mm. Yes. Um, she was Grace Kennedy's first female director of the board. She was appointed a director of the Grace Kennedy Board um, um, back in the 1970s. Oh. So um, 
Yes, she's she's still she's in her nineties now. She would be a contemporary of that person that you read from, um, Raf Diaz. So, right, right, right. You know, it's 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 you know, this is piquing our interest so much. We need to grab those three books, so we can find those three books right there on Fred's website. There's a wonderful trailer too that even tells you more about how this novel this 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 real life biographical real life novel with anecdotes from the past of Fred and his whole life and upbringing I'm still gonna tap you hard Fred because I think we need to have a biography from you it's very <laughs> intriguing, very intriguing can I can I read one last thing of course please go right ahead are we way out of time oh my god it's 20 hours how is the time? I know, you, I know you have no idea of the time, but it's okay. I have no idea of the time. I know. I'm not going to take any more of your time. This, no, this, this is a, 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 a contribution by a young, who used to be a young, but he's still around, but he, when he was hired by Grace Kennedy, his name is Errol Donovan Anderson. I don't think he'd mind if I read this because it's published in the book. He became secretary of the company and greatly admired by my dad. Anyway, this is what he said about him. He said, your dad loved people. When he graduated from university, he told me he could have gotten a job up there with any of America's top companies, but he wanted to come back to Jamaica. He wanted to employ a thousand individuals, he said. That was his goal he wanted to achieve before he died. Well, he employed 2,000. And he told me that the people who worked for him, especially in the warehouse, they were more important to him than the bags of flour that they moved around. That is why he brought into the company free medical care, for it was completely free for employees of Grace Kennedy and Kingston Wharves, and group life insurance. And that is why he brought in employee shares as well. When Michael Manley came into power, he called to me and said, Donovan, <laughs> he said, he laughed. It's not Manly Young Anderson. I am the original socialist, not Michael Manley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful point on which to wrap our conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it makes us want to know more and to read more for ourselves. Because, you know, Firstborn, that book you have written, it's not only your history. It's not only your Kennedy history. It's not only your Grace Kennedy history, it's our entire Jamaican history. Every one of us have benefited from Grace Kennedy and not just by buying the products on the shelves or not just, I have, not just when I'm happy to see Grace on the packet of the cock soup. No, not just that time, but I have done contract work with Grace Kennedy as well. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Firstborn is all of our history, is Jamaican history. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your work, Fred. Thank you for your extremely intriguing, detailed, definitive work, not only as a writer, but as an educator across the miles. Because without you, where would the rest of us be? Someone has to do it. Mm -hmm. Why not you? Why not me? What are your final words as we wrap up the word <laughs> of encouragement, Fred? Yeah, I, what I, I write. <laughs> I I just want to thank you again for promoting writers. It's a it's a wonderful wonderful thing that you're doing, and for all the writers out there, um, you know everyone has a story. Everyone has a story, and um, you can if you don't feel you have the confidence to write that story, you can certainly. Um, find mentors and people who will have the confidence in you to 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 elicit that. That you is, know. yeah. Take that step. Yeah, exactly. I'm looking forward to seeing more from you. And again, congratulations on your award. We didn't even get into deeply how that award just popped out of nowhere, and why they say they thought that that book, Firstborn, deserved this award. Did they tell you why they felt so strongly? It should be officially announced on the 14th. So I am out there. Sent me the stickers and the certificates and everything else. But I'm awaiting for the official. Um, 
Duda uh, to happen yeah, on, the, on the 14th of June. Congratulations Thank again. Thank you very much. Yeah. Jamaican, Canadian, powerful <laughs> gentleman of the pen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Responding to your hearts, you know, writing pleasure and desires. Very Thank fabulous. you again. And we look forward to reading more of your work and, you know, just hearing more from you. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, you for you, you, our Wire Right fans, for tuning in once more to this very fantastic comment. Wasn't it wonderful? <laughs> All the best. Bye. Thank you. Have a good one. Same to you. Walk good.